You heard him on part one. Now you see him in part two. Just want to make Dom from Spurs for him. And um, right. let's do our part twos. So we're finishing off talking about Swansea preferred formations. And I gave, and for those of you who didn't listen to part one, listen to it now. Well, listen to it again. I haven't listened to this. And um, I gave my formation that I'd like to go with. If given our current team, what our strongest eleven would be. Dom, can we hear your, you know, your your first eleven? You know, if we had a strong, you know, if you had everyone's everyone's um, injury free, no suspensions, who would you go with? I think there are some. Themselves, Lawrence Singapore is now established himself as number one. When we get Kabul back, I think the centre back pairings are going to be Vertonghen and Kabul. Uh, there are questions about the replication in fourth, but I think he's be established as our right back. Disco Benny on the left. Um, the two winners, you've got Leonard, obviously, and Bale. And in the middle, see, this is where it's tough. This, this is where it's tough with formation. Uh, I think Sandro, Pele, and then it's a question of whether perhaps you have Parker play one up front, or whether you keep it as that. And if you play two up front, then you will leave the foe and Adebayor. It's a tough one, but I think most of our team pretty much picks itself, assuming they're all fit. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty much, as we said, I'm pretty much with you on that. I, I think, I think the modern, because I think I'm, I don't remember the Arsenal game. Or the, probably, the, probably, I'm, I'm trying to forget that Arsenal game. You know the one where we were two 0 up and then somehow, yeah, five, you know, five, you know. Let's 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 try and ignore that. Hey, rings the bell. Vaguely rings the bell. Yeah, vaguely rings the bell. But one thing I remembered about that, and even though we were four four two, we'll be an outrun in midfield because they're three to two and they can just kept going through us like a knife through butter, and. For the love of God, I didn't think. I was thinking, why doesn't he just take off Luis Saha? Luis Saha's not doing anything. Take him off, bring a midfielder on, and somehow let's just try and win back control of midfield, or let's at least make it even. Let's match their formation. And because look, um, yeah, back in your, back in your, remember that game, that horrible game earlier this year against the Arsenal. Oh, sorry, sorry, I missed the beginning, but I thought you were talking. About the most recent game. No, I'm talking about the 2-0, the 2-0, we've managed to fuck it up. But, um, yeah, 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 it's, it's got a typical spurt, though, typical spurt. I, I agree, I think courses for courses, we use many cliches as you support, but it depends on the opposition, what formation we should play, and I think it depends also whether we're playing away or at home. I don't think there's a set answer where it's like, right, rigid, you stick to playing one up front, season long. I think we have to be adaptable, and I think we have to be depending on yeah. All of those, all of those different factors. In terms of um, something that obviously this is very contrasting, because obviously we, we mentioned Redknapp. Obviously last season Redknapp had absolutely no respect for the Europa League. Played the absolutely the weakest thing he possibly could. And obviously Villas Boas is treating the competition with a bit more respect. And having such out of you, I am now treating the competition with more respect now. Um, I'm thinking. Do you, do you think we are? He is struggling to find a balance between playing a Europa League side and playing a Premier League side. Because I thought that the last, ten, you know, obviously, I'm not, we can't use those games to say Norwich and West Brom. We weren't, we weren't playing Europa then. But against Everton, the last ten minutes, the last two minutes, does tiredness does it set in? Does it, you know, do you, do you think, do you think that that's a mitigating factor? Do you reckon or? Possibly, but then there can always be excuses. It's one of those things where, as I think we alluded to earlier, I, saw, I read a report that <clears throat> if matches finished at 80 minutes, you would actually be uh, leading the position. Yeah. If it's 90 minutes, uh, you know, where we are. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. It is all about getting the balance. Don't get me wrong, I'd love the growth if we're in it and we have a chance to win it. I think uh, I, I talked about it before, I was like, who doesn't love having a little bit of silverware, regardless of whether it's very much the second tier competition in Europe. But yeah, I, I, I would love to focus on the league and get into that top four. If we can have a run in the Europa, then hey, let's go for it. But let's think that at the expense of the league. I think everyone would be in agreement. Champions League and finishing in the top four, qualifying for the Champions League, is what we're aiming for and what we're aiming for every season now. Well, I've always thought of the Europa League as, for me, the way the team I'd always start in the Europa League essentially is. You put, we, we have seven substitutes in the Premier League. In the Premier League, you play your seven substitutes and whatever kids. And that because those, those seven substitutes, I think, if you're good enough to be a substitute for us, you know, in the Premier League, you're good enough to play in the Europa League. 
You know, if you're good enough to be have to be called on to play in the Premier League, you are good enough to play in Europa League, and you need to have games, you need to have fitness, and you need to play a competitive game where the result matters. I suppose I, I, I think you're coming from I again I don't think you can have a plain rule like No, no, not plain rule, but just a rule that you can go from, you know, a rule that you know, like yeah, a nucleus, yeah. Everything is AVB's fault. The deficit, um, the weather. What else is AVB's fault? I've forgotten now. Uh, I thought for the flooding weekend. That certainly was AVB's fault. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How is your neighbour, by the way? Is he? Uh, or she or well, she, sorry. Having had a load of water crash down through his city at the weekend, he's, he's, he's now dry and it's fixed and we've had plumbers around. But yeah, a disastrous uh, weekend. Football, bathroom, uh, flooding. All of which ABB's fault, like you said. Oh yeah, everything's ABB's fault. But um, the interesting thing that um, one of the things cause that we noticed at Spurs is that in terms of identity, because at Chelsea he was still struggling to find his team. Because obviously he never got the chance. Obviously a new manager. I can't even think of one new manager that comes in and somehow managed to do very well in his first season. That was Jose Mourinho. I think he's apart from Alex Ferguson. I think he's probably one of the finest managers we've ever seen. You know. I agree. Um, Who doesn't love the special one? You know, he yeah, doesn't have that nickname that obviously he gave to himself an office. Yeah. And if you look, I mean, incredibly, this is a guy when obviously when he left Inter, I and mean, obviously maybe you could say he saw the writing on the wall, he couldn't do any much more of Inter. I mean, he made them trip, double winning champions in, in Italy, won the European Cup. I mean, or Champions League, sorry. And he couldn't do anything better than that. How can you top that at that club? I think it was time for him to move on. But I think, you know, AVB, you know, he, you know, he's strong. I think he's still learning his team. He hasn't had that full deck of having, you know, all the players, you know, like Cabal, who was a match for last season, Parker, obviously losing two of our two of our best players in terms of Luka Modric and Rafael van der Vaart. And I think it was just, I think, he, you know, but I think I can see what some of the, what he's doing. I think there is, you kind of see what he's doing. I think he's trying to build a system and trying to, you can understand why he's doing a system because, if you have a good system that works and is flexible, then as long as you have the players to fit the system, I think one of the problems he was trying to do was trying to force players into a system. And I think that's always difficult, especially at Chelsea, where you've got such big personalities. I think that's, that's what we'll use. Because to avoid being sued, let's use the word big personalities. But uh, it's actually me getting sued anyway. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, I think at Tottenham, you've got younger players more, I think, more malleable players, so players who are willing to listen. And I'm hoping that if we, I mean, I think if we can get some young players, or, or, or like I said, Moutinho, I think the reason he's so keen to get Moutinho, I mean, I don't, I don't think they want to get Moutinho for, for abundance of reasons. I think for a £31.5 million pounds of other reasons, I think that's his release fee. And even though in paper, even though in, in practice, it won't be that much. I think to spend, I think, you know, that's what I Spend was it twenty five million pounds on a player? That's a huge for us as Spurs. That's it is, like a he has a special case because he's played for ACB. He knows the system that was successful for him before. I think I was really really disappointed when we didn't actually get Moutinho on that deadline day when it looked like we were this close. Yeah. But uh, yeah, with regards to uh, ACB and Moutinho, I think there was a documentary on Moutinho. I think just last week, which ACB was on briefly talking about it. And I agree with you. You can see what AVB, I think, is, is trying to do. And it's one of those things where Chelsea, anything that Chelsea do in terms of management decisions, I think we can pretty much dismiss. Yeah. You know, Roman is uh, known for not being trigger happy, is, is he, with his managers. I mean, Tino was a special one and he did it. But uh, Chelsea, he never had the chance. He had the, uh, the dressing room full of uh, big characters. Uh, <laughs> and he was never given the chance. You know, he was on a hiding to nothing. And look at now and, and who knows what's going to happen with Rafa. As far as I agree, it, it, it is perhaps younger, younger players, but I just think we're not a club with 
uh, oh, yeah, well, uh, that, that was never in doubt, no matter who manages us, who's always a nicer club than Chelsea. Let's face it. Not, it's, it's not just, you know, some oligarchy's uh, place. We're, we're a club with uh, tradition, and you know, Chelsea fans will uh, not make too much of that, you know, fear of winning. Most Chelsea fans I know are kind of deeply from the Glenn Hoddle, Ruth Hooder era onwards at the very best, which yeah. is uh, a shame. But, uh, but, yeah, he will be given time, given more of a chance. It seems like TV before into him, and I'll take a brand pitch. I clear, I think he'll be given time to hopefully get that system into place and, and bring us success. Yeah. I think in terms of coaching, and we've seen Levy make mistakes, and I thought I always thought Glenn Hoddle, bringing Glenn Hoddle back was going to be a high into nothing. I always said, look, that is probably the worst signing. For, that's probably the worst thing for him as a him as him being Glenn Hoddle and us as Spurs, because it's so rare. I can't. The only I can't think of one player ever to have success as both a manager. Only two actually that had success as both player and as manager, and neither was really the star of their team. You know, George Graham and Carlo Ancelotti are only the only two players who became, went back to manage their former clubs to have any success. And they weren't really the stars of their team, to be totally honest. So... But then that, 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 that's the case in, in all kind of walks. And I agree with you about getting back when you're going to tarnish your legacy. I think the fact that it's horrible, everyone knows that there's no way he will ever be anything other than a legacy. Like, even if he'd have come in and done worse than Christian Gross or worse than any of those other diabolical Jacques Santini managed clubs that we had, he still would be revered at White Hart Lane and, and rightly so. So I don't think it was too damaging to him. It was almost a stop gap. You bring back the you know, art special one, and the crowd are going to love it. I went to a number of games when he was there, and, and even when we weren't playing well, the crowd weren't as much fun in fact as it was possible as they would be perhaps with someone else. Yeah, yeah, I agree yeah. with you. It's quite risky going back. But, but, but we have done that. We've made some, you know, obviously, and then obviously, the, let's not forget the Santini, and then, you know, that, that lasted all of Because the thing is, I remember when we signed Santini, I remember saying, everyone's saying, oh, he's done very well with France, he's got them qualified on beat. I said, yeah, but they have Zidane, Henri, you know, Vieira, they've got some amazing players. And then that kind of what came, you know, that, come, that, that, that came unstuck. And I think, I don't know who he's managed since Spurs. I don't think he's really been in the game since Spurs, has he? I don't think he went to Lyon, maybe, but he's not really in the upper trees, has he? I think Spurs has perhaps been the ruin of many a man, and uh, you know, <laughs> I can't see my concerns, but it's not just Jack Sensky. We've had a number of managers up for the years that literally were meant to bring us great things and get the challenge again, or at least competing with the likes of Arsenal and then getting back up there. And it's pretty much every single one up until the kind of almost, uh, you know, um, by the full inclusion of Martin Yarl, I think he's the one that's obviously started this kind of up and in fortune. Yeah. Finishing twice. And for us that was progress and how he came and took it on further. Yeah. And and we've been, been on our way up ever since. I hope A B can uh, not continue the trend up with at least maintain it for a couple of seasons, get the score playing if he wants it, and then you know, dare I say it, the sky's the limit. Well for me I think it's incredible if he if if obviously obviously what could have, should have, would have. But I think in terms of if we had qualified for the Champions League and, you know, if we'd you know we as a cape because I think We've seen we've seen now with Aston Villa. I mean, I think what was it? Only four years ago, when under O'Neill, they they were you know really pushing in that foot fifth sixth spot. And I think you know, we, I think and I and I think in his last season he was I think he was fifth or sixth. I think no sixth because I think he was ahead of Liverpool. But I think he's sort of writing the wall. If you don't qualify for the Champions League, you have two choices: you either spend big, or eventually look, become resigned to the fact that you will lose your best players. And you won't be able to track any better players. And I think, hopefully, I don't. Although we've lost Luca, we, you know, not, you know, not through choice. Rafa was kind of a mutual thing. I think if we had to get back in the Champions League or the Wenger Cup, whatever you want to call it, we'll hopefully keep our better, you know, somewhat. We won't lose. We may not add players of like the, the incredible caliber of players, but in terms of the landscape, if you look at it. Um, we've obviously seen Inter Milan. They're telling Schneider, take a pay cut, or if you don't take a pay cut, we're not going to play you. You know, so I think their financial model has changed quite a lot. You know, from what you know, the glory days of the 90s when they were spending gazillions. You know, and I think yeah. you've got basically the money really is either in Russia, Barcelona and Real, Parrot PSG, and and a few clubs in the Premiership. I think, and obviously, although you know, although Bayern Munich. They can spend big. 
they don't tend to spend big per se. Um, that's true. Well, we we are clearly not in the press along in terms of what we can spend. We're not a uh, Man City, Chelsea, or a Pitch, etc., etc. Et However, I don't think we we are necessarily those fifty million pound players. We you know, our scouting network is what Jens like the aforementioned Luka Modric. That I know it's easier said than done, but that's what we have to be aiming for. You know being able to spot and find those players at the age where literally they can come for not crazy money, where they're not so over hyped that they're massive over but where they have the potential to develop exactly like another model. Yeah. Finding those players and identifying them though it will be the uh, sixty four billion dollar question and the well, problem. Well speaking of how good our scouts know it's not only the benefit of us, it's benefit of Chelsea. I mean Mata, um, Oscar we um, Hazard, obviously everyone knew Hazard was, but we are, we're, we're just a giving club, aren't we? We just like to help people out. Why are you out. trying to make me Pardon? Why, why are you trying to depress me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's like Oscar is coming to us. Um, that, you know, they've got a formidable attacking line. It, it's kind of infuriating that they've got their anti football champions league win because if we had qualified in that fourth place, I, we could have attracted you know, some of those types of players. Yeah, but you know, sadly that isn't the case. But who knows? We never know. I mean, Raf, you know, Raf Benitez, they still hate him, and who knows? I mean, beating beating the mighty Sunderland, that could turn it around for him, couldn't it? Yeah, that could be the game that you know where his fortunes turn I know, around. Uh, Chelsea, uh, Chelsea, and, and so I know how they have been run, and it's it's shameful, shameful situation. Raf from a high school, you know, boots on his foot, escaping guard. It's quite, it's quite refreshing to see the, uh, the decline of Chelsea this season, but it's a season and you know, with the players they've got, they're all going to be up there. So well, it's a crazy league. I mean, Arsenal were 10th on Saturday, and then winning, they, they got up to 6th. You know, and it's, it's one of those crazy leagues that we're in, was it? We were doing, I don't, I don't know, we weren't 10th or whatever, I don't know where we were, but somehow we ended up being 4th. It just, I think it's, I think, should we, should we use another catchphrase, a yo-yo league? Yeah, teams uh, will be yo-yoing up the league, the league positions. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, there's, there's lots of teams where you know, a, a few wins in a row can make a massive amount of difference. You've got two Manchester clubs, even though Man United have pulled away a bit. But underneath that, there are a load of clubs, and I'm hoping that Chelsea are going to get sucked into it as well, but we shall see. There's us, Arsenal, right there, Liverpool might even have a resurgence, you know, Everton, or we speak up. It's one of those things where a couple of losses you'll slip down, a couple of wins, you can you can you can jump right back up again. You know, people moaning about Arsenal being in their worst league position, I think, since they've been there. Yeah. It's a couple of wins, and they'll be right back to them. Yeah. And it was, it was, I saw the game, and then Cazorla, I mean, the way he went down, and that, I mean, that was like, I was like, are you kidding me? And then obviously the, the you know, Hockley Chamberlain fouls a player, and then draws the foul. <laughs> Sometimes you have, sometimes, like I said, the stars align and they all align for you. I mean, like, like I said, that, that overhead kick to um, Jelovic, that could have skied up in the ground, cleared the crossbar, whatever, but somehow fell to Jelovic. And, you know, credit to him, he went in. And sometimes, you know, just because you get the penalties, I mean, you'll score them, as we found out, you know, sometimes, you know. You know, and just, you yeah, know, that's one, one of the things. Exactly. And Bayern Munich found out as well. <laughs> and, and Barcelona. I mean, I for uh, many a year. I don't. I can't remember a, a time, you know, even, even at my advanced age now, whether we've ever we've ever made things easy for ourselves. And it's always, you know, I I, I still got friends that remind me of the four three to, to Man City in the uh, in the cup. Oh <laughs> yes, please don't forget. And, remember that. And I thought this is a crazy bet you've had it with me at half time. You know, we've gone down to ten men, three and a half, and they end up coming back four three. Only with Spurs. Only with Spurs. Do you know I what? think we're kind of used to things like that happening. But do you know what? If do you know what? Let's face it though, coaches are fun because of the up, because of the up, all the best things in life are fun because of all the up and down. And let's leave it at that. <laughs> you know, coasters, yeah. other things are, that go up and down. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and if, they, if you didn't have your up and down, it wouldn't be fun. If we'd just be straight going through, you know what? Life wouldn't be fun. It'd be boring. It'd be, you know, very pedestrian. It'd be like Arsenal, you know? So, uh, yeah. Hey. Exactly. I almost knew we were going to go with another fire out analogy, but uh, we went in 